Good morning, everybody. I'm Mark Coleman, your co-host today again for with uh, Talking Tax, right here on Think Tech Hawaii, your favorite community affairs programming. And uh, Talking Tax is all about taxes, as you might have guessed. And the co-host with me is Tom Yamachika. He's president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. I'm with the Grassroots Institute of Hawaii. Um, we have similar goals in some ways, but um, Tom is usually really just focused only on taxes. And that, of course, is what we're talking about today. We also have a very special guest, Rhonda Sparlin from Denver, Colorado. She's a, she's a, she's a partner in the state and local tax services group of Ruben Brown, which is based in Denver. She's joining us today from Denver. And she's going to talk with us today about um, Colorado's tax situation. They have a really interesting program there called the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, which helps limit government spending and by uh, putting a cap on tax increases. Um, Tom Yamachika, Tom wrote about this in his uh, weekly column a couple of weeks ago, um, talking about based on uh, the governor's, uh, Jared Paulus, Colorado governor's state of the state address in which he actually called for tax cuts. And Jared is a Democrat, so we're kind of hoping that would rub off on our Democratic governor, who in fact has proposed some pretty significant tax cuts uh, for this year. It, it arose last year, and we hope that that will go through. But anyway, uh, let's start talking about this column and how it all relates to Colorado. Tom, you want to set up the uh, set up the stage there? Well, sure. Uh, um, what, what we're talking about today is Colorado. Uh, it's a, uh, I, I don't know if you could call it a, a blue state like ours. It, it definitely it's not as blue as we are, but uh, it has a Democratic governor. And one of the things that caught my attention about uh, Colorado this year is the state of the state address that Governor Paulus gave. And, you know, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but I, I also wanted to give, you know, some other detail about, you know, our special guest today, Rhonda Sparlin. Uh, is with Reuben Brown. Reuben Brown, I think, is is headquartered in St. Louis, but it's uh, it's all over the United States. Um, and uh, uh, Rhonda is the a partner in charge of uh, state tax uh, for firm wide. Right. Correct. So so uh, so she is a celebrity within Reuben Brown, and <laughs> and for us too, and and she's the. Uh, uh, the greatest Colorado tax practitioner to ever walk the face of the earth, <laughs> in my humble opinion. So, what we what we want to talk to uh, today about is this passage from uh, from uh, Governor Paulus's State of the State address. He said, "As demonstrated by our healthy Tabor t Tabor being Taxpayer Bill of, Bill of Rights surplus in Colorado, taxes are simply too high." income taxes, property taxes, and the state sales tax. We ignore that signal at our own peril, and I challenge Democrats and Republicans to work together to improve our economic growth and success by not taking taxes we can't keep from people and instead working on a bold, balanced, progressive package, including cutting the income tax rate, which, uh, which by the way, is at like 4%. It's 4.4%, it's yes. So it's not... It's not very high to begin it's with. It's not very high. To other it's states. like one of the lowest. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, we, we, here in flat, Hawaii, we're talking it's a, about it, yeah, it's a, uh, a top rate of 11%. Yes, right. right. Yeah, I was, uh, and, and, and that's just the income tax rate. I mean, I was comparing the, uh, the tax burden, you might say, the whole tax burden of Colorado against other states, and, you know, not just the income tax. And and depending on which whether it's Wallet Hub or Tax Foundation, they're, they they come in very low, um, like fifth, you know, for Wallet Hub, at eight point five nine percent of of all, you know, that's the total tax burden, eight point five percent, and Tax Foundation it's nine point seven. They would rank number six in terms of the states there, whereas why uh, Tax Foundation were almost fifteen percent, fourteen point nine nine. And uh, according to Wallet Hub, we're 12.29. And um, that puts us up at 48 for the tax foundation, number 48, highest tax burden. 
uh, followed by Connecticut and New York and 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 in Wallet Hub. It's, um, oh, if you if you think 40. that's something, <laughs> if you think that's something, Wallet Hub put out a, a a list recently about you know which states take the you know uh, take the top tax burden uh, of low income taxpayers, high income taxpayers, and those in the middle. Uh, and one state and only one state was in the bottom five of all three lists. Wow. And guess, and guess what? <laughs> and, uh, and, and Colorado was way up there. Oh, I? Colorado was way up there. Um, yeah. so, so, so Rhonda, tell us a little bit about the, uh, about, about the background of, you know, Tabor and, and, yeah. and what, what's been going on in Colorado. Yeah. yeah so, so let's do talk about that because I think while each of you are, are, you know, pointing this out and pointing out this analysis, I honestly, I don't know that, that it's truly reflective of what's happening in the state. You know, I, I think Tom and you, you and I both know the devil is typically in the details, right? And so, Absolutely. um, you know, I think that there's a lot that's happening. Um, yes, we have a flat 4.4% income tax rate that has dropped to that level over, you know, through a number of voter initiatives, as well as legislative initiatives, you know, or, or passage of laws by, by the legislature over the years, quite honestly, over a couple of decades. But at the same time, we have a state, and, and again, we have pretty reasonable state sales tax rates. We have a very low state sales tax rate of 2.9%. And then if you're in the Denver metropolitan area, you've got special districts that are an additional 1.1%. So a total of 4% in the in the metropolitan district that's, you know, cover pretty much collected by the state. But then we have almost 70 home rural cities who it's like having 70 states in the state of Colorado from a sales tax perspective. And those rates are anywhere from three to like five and a half percent. And so while the rates may be in line with what other what you see in other states, the complexity level for businesses to operate in Colorado is tremendous compared to other states. Well, and I'm then, the and, and very quickly, and also I just uh, came back from a Colorado Chamber board meeting where, and, and you will, you should have seen or would possibly heard, you know, there was a special session of the legislature called by the governor at the end of um, November, beginning of December last year, and we've had an interim council on property tax reform, and they just gave their uh, recommendations, I believe, last Friday, because our property tax rates are increasing tremendously, as well as the valuations. And so, you know, just the number I can remember that was thrown out that's just expected this year is a, almost another um, $3.8 billion of property tax revenues just because kind of the foundational uh, structure of how property taxes and in, in the various special districts and all the mill levies that get piled on top of those valuation increases. Well, if I may, just to be clear, you're, are you trying to say that because um, the various metropolitan areas do they they can levy their own sales taxes? Is that what you're saying? Yes. And the counties collect the property taxes there, right? Yes. Right. Um, but okay, so that analysis though that I was mentioning was local and state and local tax burden. But what you're saying is even though it's really wonderful, there's always that push to keep raising taxes, right? That's right. Or that they can, or that the complexity because. Because it's like dealing with, you know, you could have a state exemption for, for affordable housing. You could have a state exemption for projects that are structured a certain way and that meet the affordable housing need in our state. But the local 
if it's in a if it's in a jurisdiction where it's a local home rule city, they may not honor that exemption. And so, you know, you could have about five percent of the cost of that affordable housing project basically go back to the government through sales taxes on the cost of the materials and the construction oh, yeah, materials yeah, or reconstruction yeah. and that type of thing. Sure. And so it increases it's a it's an artificially it's increasing the cost. Sure. Of, of what, you know, they're they're trying to get affordable housing, but then there's a certain percentage of that that's going back to the government sure. through the, the sales taxes or other taxes. Well, yeah, well, but I guess the, the overarching principle, though, is uh, that you have Tabor. Yeah. Uh, which have is Tabor, yes. Yeah, Tabor, which is a, yeah. a constitutional provision. It is. It is. And I'm in, in the Colorado you, Constitution. It, it is. And it. You know, you're going to get historical on me now, or maybe I'm going to get historical on you, but Go it's, for it. It, it goes back to, you know, 1992. And again, we have local control through these sales taxes and other taxes. And there were a number of things that Tabor was meant to do. It was, first off, to to try to limit the growth of government, you know, the un, the, the, the un, Try to put some guardrails about the growth of government in the state of Colorado. And that meant if there were um, laws that they wanted to pass through that would have a direct or indirect increase in the tax burden, they needed to be voted on by the electorate before they could pass. Um, I would tell you that that that. Um, that's one of the provisions. There were other provisions, but that's probably, you know, one of the main provisions that everyone's aware of. And I will tell you that that's lost some of its, um, it's not as strong as it used to be. There have been some court cases over the decades uh, that have limit, have, have said, look, if, you know, for instance, in the legislature, if you want to have a bill that increases tax, uh, maybe increases the sales tax, broadens the sales tax base, but then in that same bill, you give, uh, you increase the earned income tax credit or the child care credit in the state of Colorado, those can offset. You know, you, you will, we'll have our legislative, you know, legislative uh, analysis group do the analysis, but those could potentially offset and those don't have to be voted on. So you can have you can have these tax increases in particular sectors, um, corporate, you know, corporate or business taxes versus individual taxes, as long as they're in the same bill and they they have a neutral impact, then you know, maybe you don't require a vote of the people. Well, but you know, but I think the um the remarkable thing uh, is that you have guardrails in the first place. Right. Um, you know, a lot of states don't. We don't. Right. Uh, and 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 there was, uh, and I know because I participated in this as you know with with uh, um, the NFIB uh, amicus brief. Uh, there was litigation over, you know, the the question of whether you know Tabor is constitutional at all, uh, because uh, you know a group of legislators were saying, well, look. The U.S. Constitution guarantees us a Republican form of government, and that means uh, we, the legislature, get to tax people however we want and, and with no limits. And, uh, and the Supreme Court basically said, um, no. <laughs> the, the, the people have the power. Right. right. Well, the people have the power. This voting part, this voting part of the, if, if the legislature passes a tax increase or would like to pass a tax increase, it's supposed to go to the voters, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, what is that? Is that do they have to wait till the following November? I mean, I'm not sure what the time mm -hmm. frame is. Yeah, yeah. So it, oh. it becomes an initiative, and we have we have a. So I know there are referendums and there are initiatives, and I will just say, you know, I will, you know, I kind of view it as, and I'll probably get this wrong because I am I'm unlike both of you where you're used to doing these these podcasts and you're a journalist and you you've got all the terms correct I'm a tax practitioner so I kind of understand that there can be um ballot issues that either come from 
citizen groups or groups that get signatures of citizens, or they can come from the legislature and be on the ballot. And so we we have a, typically, uh, honestly, I cannot remember an election, a November election for years now where there isn't something on our ballots in Colorado that deals with some aspect of taxes. And in fact, oh, we, at this meeting I was just at earlier today, I mean, there's there's probably four, there's anywhere from four to six, to six different property tax proposals that they're working through with the title board, the different groups are negotiating to which one will show up on the ballot. So does that apply to even um, county property tax increases? Or city uh, or whoever who who is the counties over there that raise property taxes? Yeah, so they well yes there well there's a, all kinds of districts water districts uh, fire districts uh, well, you know they're districts. collective school districts you know the counties uh, that type of thing so it it applies however there's also so this. Tabor was the brainchild of a former legislator named Doug Bruce. And um, so the, it was also determined in the decades since it passed that uh, local jurisdictions could have elections where, again, the, the folks who live in that locality could choose to de-Bruce, as, as it's been called now. Because what it what it basically was, it was elections that would allow the localities to keep this excess revenue. And, and to get back to what Tom read at the beginning of, of this podcast, um, you know, what happens at the state level is we typically get an income tax refund. There's a refund for everyone who files a personal income tax, a refund of a certain dollar amount, depending on how big that Tabor excess dollar oh, is, revenue is. Is, is and, that And is so that what at the local it? level, they can just vote to keep that. I they see. can go through a vote and keep that. And so, yes, it does apply. However, most of the counties, to my understanding, have had have held those types of elections and their electorate have said, if we if we pay you too much, if it, if it's growing too greatly, you can keep that excess revenue and put it to good work. I see. So is that what is that what the I was going to ask you? What is what did the governor mean when he was talking about our healthy Tabor surplus? Right. Is, right. Is that is that so this gets this gets there's a standard, there's a certain limitation in Tabor about how what the growth of state revenues can be, general right. fund revenues can be. Hmm. And if every time if the economy is going growing well, um there, again. You know, with uh, sales tax collections oh, have grown significantly, all of that general fund revenue or in the population has grown, all of those things. If we grow above a certain limitation, then those are excess revenues. Oh, and there so are certain refund mechanisms that apply uh, when you hurt, hit certain levels. But at a certain point, if it's above all of those, then again, on the individual income tax returns, Every individual, every resident individual who's filing an income tax return gets a specified dollar amount. And wow. I'll tell you again, in some years, you know, it's it some years it's been um it's been phased according to what your level of income was. And maybe at the highest levels, maybe it was fifty dollars or seventy dollars or something like that. This year is eight hundred dollars. Mm, nice. And it's and that's for everyone. Mm -hmm. And what are the teeth that that support this activity? I mean, that you know, what if they don't? Uh, are there any penalties? Is there a way that they can violate this uh, Tabor? They've been trying for years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's um, you know what it is really, Mark. I think it's. It just shows that it can easily, there can easily be a mismatch of the revenues and the tax revenues that are paid to the state or the localities. There can be a mismatch of that versus 
who bears the cost of the services. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you know, well, well, the state gets all of the income tax re revenues and gets, you know, a, a, a small portion of the sales tax revenues and that type of thing. Um, you know, the, the localities in the counties, as you've mentioned a couple of times, they're the ones who are collecting the property taxes and they're the ones who are trying to provide all the local services. And, the, you know, so while the state may be flush with money, depending on a particular locality's demographic, they could have extreme needs and the monies aren't being, you know, they're not getting the surplus of funds. Mm -hmm. to be able yeah, to I mean, you, you compare that with what happens here in Hawaii, it, it's very, very different. I mean, we have uh, a, a so-called general fund expenditure ceiling, uh, but uh, that can be overridden by, uh, I believe, a majority vote of the legislature. Yeah. And it happens every year. Two-thirds. Uh, Two-thirds, yeah, that happens every year. And um, we have a provision calling for, uh, you know, excess monies uh, to be refunded to the taxpayers. But but they've um, amended that constitutional provision over the years so it can, it, you know, it can go to other other things like um, uh, other post-employment benefits, the rainy day fund. So, and, and, and even when there, there were... None of these other alternatives. Uh, the the legislature complied with the constitutional mandate by giving taxpayers a refund of one dollar. Dollar. One dollar. One dollar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was pretty slimy. Yeah, I mean that's that's I think what you know one 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 difference between uh, uh, you know Colorado and us is that we've got more s slimier legislators. <laughs> and, 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 and the and the thing is too is um, th there is no penalty really for uh, exceeding the budget. Like Tom said, if they if they there is a cap in the constitution, but if they they can all vote. In fact, the bills even go through sometimes now with a statement. This bill will push us into the you know excess exceed the limit the budget limit, and they all just go along with it. Uh, you know, one of the virtues of a one party state, I guess, um, pretty much. Right. Uh, well, and, and please understand, I mean, when Tabor went into effect, uh, it was a much more balanced government in Colorado. We're also a blue state where the governor is Democratic. Both houses of our legislature are Democratic. In fact, I think uh, the last election, uh, every key office on the ballot at the state level was, you know, voted Democratic. So this has been happening, and, we, and we've been in that type of um, atmosphere or environment now for eight to 12 years. Well, apparently the governor there is somewhat of a libertarian. It sounds like he's, um, you know, maybe more Akamai about the economics, the principles of economics. But Tom did make the point in his column and, and that... Democrats cutting taxes is not unheard of. And like I said, our own governor is proposing, uh, I think it's about a $200 million tax cut. He wants to raise the standard deduction on the personal, um, something else. And then he wants to index everything to inflation. Do they do that, by the way, in Colorado, index the tax rates to, the tax rates, uh, to inflation? Not the not the tax rates, but, but many of the other, like, the, the legislature has become very keen or very smart about that in the last few years so that when they are putting uh, some new provision into the tax law, they are making, and it sets, you know, a threshold, they are making sure to put in the language as well that this will be uh, be subject to revision according to, inf you know, to inflation based upon certain indicators yeah, that's um, so that happens. it can grow, which is which is really important because I think I think again what we see as tax practitioners is, uh, you know, even a hundred thousand dollars that went into effect, you know, for a sales tax threshold, uh, you know, in the last five or six years, I mean that hundred thousand dollars doesn't have the same meaning today as what it had five or six years ago. Well, according to your governor in the speech that Tom cited, uh, he he he. He said that President Kennedy didn't just launch the moonshot, 
he delivered one of the largest income tax cuts in history. And, and, and he also, you also talked to Tom about President Obama's calls for cutting income tax. Did he ever do that? Did Obama ever do that? Or was he just calling for it? Boy, I, that would be difficult for me. I, I, you know, that I'm a little bit stuck on what the memory exactly, you know, I'd hate to say, I'd hate to speculate. And then they always talk about the Reagan tax cuts, but then I get different signals on that, that, you know, maybe overall the spending did go up and whatever. I'm not really sure about that part of history either. But in Hawaii, um, Tom, is that, do you think Governor Green is on the right track or he could do more, right? Well, and I mean, he, he, situation, perhaps? Uh, he, he can only do what the legislature lets him, you know, I mean, it, it's it's got to be a cooperative environment for anything to go through. That's so, true. So, so That's last true. year he proposed it didn't go through. This right. year's proposing it again. We'll we'll see what happens. The jury's still out. Right. Well, it, it, what about the possibility of ever getting a Tabor for Hawaii? Uh, that I think would be very interesting. Um, uh, if we could, you know, get something in our constitution that that uh, you know didn't have loopholes and ways around it and 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 backdoor strategies yes. uh, that we've always been using up to the, up to this point. Do you think do you think people in Hawaii would support that? It, you know, be, being a thing that would have to go to the voters. Well, of course, it would have to go to the voters, and yeah, I think, I think they would support it. Um, but uh, I I don't think that any existing legislator would want to put that before the people. No, we just have to find somebody, don't we? And, and so so Rhonda, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, it was really nice. I know you and Tom used to work together with Price Waterhouse Cooper, an accounting firm, and. Uh, you you were never here in Hawaii, of course, but you know you're always welcome to come visit. Have you ever been to Hawaii? Oh, multiple times. It's one of my favorite places on earth. I love the Big Island. That's that is just I. I would love to be there. Give me about four weeks. I would love to be there. I don't have that plan, <laughs> but um, I just I just every island. I've been uh, I've been on a number of your islands, and I I just uh, again one of the one of the greatest places on earth. Yeah, yeah but tax season has to uh, end first. That's right. Well, That's thank right. you again, Rhonda, for being here today. And Tom, good to see you again. And we'll see you, everybody, um, everybody next week or two weeks from now, I hope, or whenever this next episode comes out. Thank you very much for joining us today on Talking Tax on Think Tech Hawaii. If you like this program, hit the like button below and feel free to go to our website and watch all the rest of our shows. Aloha. this show, why don't you give us a like or subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much.